Hello, I'm Hilary, and this week's big news is that we have reached the 75% mark. That's to say that we are now three quarters of the way through after this week's reading, and you know, that's an achievement indeed. Every time I have thought negatively about a book that we were about to tackle, God has He's blown me away with what I've seen, what I've mulled on, at times I've even understood more clearly. Isaiah was one of those books that I wasn't really looking forward to tackling, but it's it's been really interesting. So it's day one, it's Isaiah 23 to 27, and I've been thinking a bit about prophecy, about these records from the prophets that kind of show us how prophecy functions, the different ways the information comes in and then how they are communicated. And our messages in the new covenant setting tend to have a different topic and tone, but the delivery hasn't really changed that much. There's still lots of symbolism and visions and dreams and literal instructions and warnings. And there's the fact that God could have chosen a different name for this New Testament role, but he didn't. He continued to call it a prophet, and I think that speaks of it being about the same role, but a different agreement, culture, church structure, if you like. So here's some of what I saw about prophecy in today's reading. Sometimes the prophet is shown a movie-like story of something that's happening, as if it has already happened. The harbour and the houses of Tyre are gone would be a description of that. And sometimes God uses songs or poetry from that time or culture to send them a message. But then the city will come back to life as in the song about the prostitutes. And there are also times that he reveals a new song, something to be sung by the prophet before it's actually happened in that day everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. And he also uses exaggeration to stress points. He devastates the surface of the earth and scatters the people. The earth will be completely emptied and looted would be an example of that. And of course, he often uses metaphors and similes in his rich symbolic language to explain to us on earth what is already understood in heaven. For instance, only a remnant is left, like the stray olives left on the tree, or the earth staggers like a drunk. As we saw last week, there are confirmations of those symbols that he uses for rulers and authorities. In that day, the Lord will punish the gods in the heavens and the proud rulers of the nations on the earth, and then the glory of the moon will wane and the brightness of the sun will fade. And there's something about the correlation between what is prophesied and a physical response on earth in nature. The earth mourns and dries up, it suffers for the sins of its people. There are also times the prophet just worships the Lord, just taking his eyes off all these possible futures that he's seeing and onto the realities of God in his present moment. I will honour and praise your name for you are my God and you do such wonderful things. And I notice that when he does that, it leads to this redemptive prophecy, being able to see beyond the kind of darkness of their immediate future. And we saw that pattern in the Psalms as well, worship leading to truth and declaration leading to be able to see a future truth so amazing, so beyond them, a time when God will remove the cloud of gloom and the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. And it's a pattern that is in the song of chapter 26 too, the declaration leading to the true perspective that God's way is not too steep and rough, that he is a God who does what is right and smooths out the path ahead of us. Another thing that I noticed today is Leviathan, the big monster. So we're in the context of Israel's future redemption, a time when those who will be exiled will return to Jerusalem. And it's on that day that the Lord will take his terrible swift sword and punish Leviathan, the swiftly moving serpent, the coiling, writhing serpent he will kill 
the dragon of the sea and it's like something out of a Lord of the Rings movie. But the word translated Leviathan in Strong's Concordance argues for a literal creature, saying that this could be an extinct dinosaur, a large fire-breathing animal, and then compares its fire-breathing abilities to the bombarder beetle, which has a literal explosion-producing ability. Wow. So we first meet Leviathan in the book of Job, and whether Job is a literal or a symbolic account, the speeches from God are set in the context of what he actually created. The earth, the sea, the weather, the stars, the lions, the ravens, the deers and the horses. And in this non-symbolic setting, God says, can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? Can you make it a pet? like bird or give it to your little girls to play with. If you lay your hand on it, you will certainly remember the battle that follows and you won't try that again. And his description of the animal is really detailed. I want to emphasize Leviathan's limbs and its enormous strength and graceful form. Its scales are like rows of shields tightly sealed together. The writer of Psalm 74 and 104 used language to suggest that this animal was a reality for them, again set in a literal context. See the ships sailing along and Leviathan, which God you made to play in the sea. Or you split the sea by your strength, and that literally happened, of course, when they were escaping from Egypt. And God, you smashed the heads of the sea monsters. I think the records and the science point to this being a real animal created by God. But I think because it's described as breathing fire, we struggle with that because we assume that all the mystical creatures are imagined from scratch and they're not really influenced by what could have existed or or only a little bit. And because it is used as a symbol at times, this dragon or leviathan, it's easier for us to believe that it is only symbolic. But I would argue that in order for something to be used as a symbol, some element of that needs to have existed. How can we find the meaning of a symbol that we have never heard of and never has existed? Leviathan is used as a symbol for evil in human beings. Wake up, O Lord, clothe yourself with strength, flex your mighty arm, rouse yourself as in the days of old when you slew Egypt, the dragon of the Nile, and possibly also as a symbol for an evil spiritual being. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon. Okay, we're back to the historical accounts and it's day two, 2 Kings 18, 1 to 8 and 2 Chronicles 29 to 31 and Psalm 48. And hello, King Hezekiah. And for the first time, I think one of these kings is likened to David. A few verses on confirms that there was no one like him, Hezekiah that is, among the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. His first priority is open the temple so that those who want to get right with God can. And in the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord. And that means that the temple needs cleaned up and the priests need to be back at their posts ministering to the Lord. And the Levites we see get right to work. And it also needs musicians using those anointed instruments that David made. So he gets them stationed at the temple of the Lord and makes sure they've got their cymbals and their lyres and their harps. And it works. The entire assembly worships the Lord and the singers sing and the trumpets blow and all the burnt offerings are done. And we can imagine our psalm today, Psalm 48, being proclaimed here in the restored temple of Jerusalem. How great is the Lord, how deserving of praise in the city of our God, which sits on his holy mountain. And what stood out to me the most about Hezekiah is the way that he goes about the restoration project. His father Ahaz reigned for 16 years until he was 36 years old, we are told. And that means that since the age of nine, his father has been king and he has been his successor. 
and his father completely rejects God. So how did Hezekiah become so strong in his faith? An indication may be his mother's side of the family. It's not completely clear. But it struck me that if he was 25 years old when he became king, then he had to patiently wait until it was his time. And it reminds me a bit of David and Saul. Hezekiah doesn't force his way to the throne. But it's not an inactive waiting. When his time does come, he seems to be absolutely ready with a plan. He's got his priorities set. He's worked on his relationship with God. We see Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. And as a result, he was really successful. And his plan is also flexible. He is working in partnership with God. He's adapting and adjusting as the people responded. So for instance, they decided to celebrate Passover a month later than usual because there just weren't enough priests that would be purified by then. And then they decide to continue the festival for another seven days. And note, he doesn't force the priests to be purified. It happens organically really from not enough priests to many more priests purified themselves and then for they had all been faithful in purifying themselves and he doesn't see God as some kind of rigid unmovable pernickety force he's got this heart connection that we've seen before relationship trumps religious activity every time it says he prayed for them and they were allowed to eat the Passover meal anyway even though it was contrary to the requirements of the law. And I loved how he encourages them in their journey back to God. There's just so much to learn from his approach. And we will leave Hezekiah there for it is a new book alert. Although probably collated by other people, Hosea's messages are thought to be his own. Hosea is a prophet from around 760 to 722 BC. So he overlaps with other prophets like Isaiah and Amos and Micah and Jonah. And he lives in Israel. And when he starts giving messages, the evil Jeroboam the second is in power in Israel. And in Judah, we've got Uzziah. And he's still giving messages right through to when Hezekiah is in charge. And his messages or poems are mainly aimed at Israel. They are happening in the years just before the nation is going to be destroyed in 722 BC. So we are in day three and it's Hosea 1 to 6. And what stood out to me was Hosea is living the prophetic words. And that made me wonder, why ask this of him? Why not just give him the words? It would be a much deeper, more powerful experience with more power in the words, I suspect, if you think of the power of a testimony, a story, not just of the facts, but of what God has done in that person, the emotions of the person who experiences it. And there's a power, I think, that lies in that, in the heart of the person who's giving the story. And God's reason in the New Living Translation for his plan is that this will illustrate how Israel has acted. But this is actually an added explanation to what's there. Closer to the wording is simply do this because it parallels what they are doing. So it's more like God is asking Hosea to literally come into some kind of parallel experience in his personal life of what the nation of Israel is doing. His prostitute wife is a symbol of Israel. Her clients, called lovers, represent the various gods that people will worship. And from this point, Hosea's life events mirror Israel's future life events. Name the child Jezreel, for I am about to. And possibly also his emotional experiences mirror God's own emotions over Israel. Name your daughter Lo Ruhamah, not loved, for I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. And the actions of his life also act as these markers in history that link to the future. The meaning of the name of his third child seems to be spoken at a specific place, and then that links to a time of redemption. Then at the place where they were told, you are not my people, it will be said, you are the children of the living God. 
And it must have been really weird, a very different way of living to live and feel the day-to-day detail of it while keeping a kind of aerial perspective, a big picture attitude. And I'm reminded of Isaiah saying, the Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. So when he gets the words of poetry that she is no longer my wife, he seems to act on it because later on God will ask him to go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another. Because that's how God feels about Israel. God will win her back once again and lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. And that marriage metaphor stood out to me. I'm remembering Song of Songs, and I suspect the belief that Solomon's song is symbolic of our relationship with God is linked to this passage. But notice the anchoring points in today's passage, points that clarify the context for the metaphor. While God will say of Israel, she will give herself to me there as she did long ago when she was young, he anchors it in statements like, O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips. I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. And he's clear on who is speaking to them. In that day, I will answer, says the Lord. And we didn't see this kind of language in Song of Songs. And when God does use sex as a symbol, Hosea having to say to his wife, during this time you won't have sexual relationships with anybody, not even with me. This shows that Israel will go a long time without a king or a prince and without sacrifices, sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. Notice that there is no descriptions about the act of sex itself, unlike Song of Songs, which was all descriptions. And lastly, I saw confirmation of something that I've seen about leadership for a long time, and that is that we can really only lead people as far as we go ourselves. And that works when it's both towards God and also away from God. Leaders have responsibility. It says, don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. My people are being destroyed because they do not know me, since you priests refuse to know me. So because they aren't growing in knowing God, the people can't grow in knowing God. And this is contrasted with Hosea's leadership, which says, come, let us return to the Lord. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. And in it all, God's heart is he wants them to show love, not sacrifices. He wants them to know him, to experience them for themselves. And in day four in Hosea 7 to 11, he had begged them to plow up the hard ground of their hearts. For now is the time to seek the Lord and that he would come and shower them with righteousness. But instead, They cultivate wickedness and they harvest this thriving crop of sins. It's a great description. And we are reminded that sin is anything in our lives that would stop us from being who we were created to be. Anything that acts like a capturer or drives us away from God. And it will often feel like we don't really have an escape or we don't have much control, but that is the lie that is often what keeps us captive. A step on from this stage is we actually begin to love the sin that holds us there. We just no longer see it as sin. We don't see it as anything that's holding us. We see it as almost the opposite, as some kind of freedom because we got to choose it. Now God shares that He really wants to heal Israel, but its sins have become too great. He wants to redeem them, but they're so far against them that they're telling lies about them and they just no longer see the truth. It's too late. The people of Israel have rejected what is good and now their enemies are going to chase after them. And like before the flood, there's this sense that everything everywhere is just evil all the time. 
their sinful deeds are all around them. He says ever since Gibba there has been only sin and more sin and you've made no progress whatsoever. In fact God describes their progress as going in the opposite direction. When Israel was a child I loved him and I called him my son out of Egypt but the more I called to him, the further he moved away from me. And the way in which God describes how he feels is the context that we need to read these warnings and consequences, punishments within, or we're going to get that skewed view of God's justice that leads us further away from him. Listen to his words to them. He says, I myself taught Israel how to walk leading him by the hand. But he doesn't know or even care that it was I that took care of him. I led Israel with my ropes of kindness and love. I lifted the yoke from his neck and I myself stooped to feed him. Let me consider pausing the video for just a minute and acknowledging how God feels about you. Maybe being thankful or asking him to bring to mind the smaller details of his care for you that you haven't seen. As we move towards the peak of the mountain of Israel's consequences, Isaiah affirms other prophecies and words of knowledge like a window into political events. The people of Israel have become like silly, witless doves, first calling to Egypt, then flying to Assyria for help. The people have appointed kings without God's consent and trusted in their military might, believing that great armies can make their nation safe. And it says, even if you escape destruction from Assyria, Egypt will conquer you. And in the midst of all this, God reveals something of his nature as a creator and not a destroyer, saying, I will not completely destroy Israel, for I am God, not a mere mortal, and I am the Holy One living among you, and I will not come to destroy. So in day five, he reveals a time when his anger will seemingly be gone forever. We are in Hosea 12 to 14 and Isaiah 28 to 29. And this incredible statement is what stood out to me as we finish Hosea's prophecies. God's anger gone forever. Is it talking about a time at the end of time, as we know it, of the, the new eternal Jerusalem, or is it talking of the work of the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus? Let's look at the context. The context is healing for faithlessness and that God's love will know no bounds. And I felt prompted to look at the no bounds angle. And in doing so, I found that the NRSV and other translations, they translate this passage really differently. There's no word for forever. What the New Living Translation interprets gone forever are two words that actually mean turned away or turned from. And this fits a lot better with what we've seen before when God's people turn back to him, he turns towards them. His wrath has done its work and caused them to come back to him and so he can turn away from that anger again. And that stresses again the importance of reading with Holy Spirit and being aware of his promptings, even or especially if they don't seem particularly logical in the moment. Obedience and learning go hand in hand, I have found. I could always just read several translations, but it, you know, reading through the whole Old Testament in more than one translation is going to take about five years. But if we're tuned in, and we're prayerful for his help, then that's what we can expect. We can expect help. And we remember that the search for wisdom is first a search for God. Let those who are wise understand these things. Let those with discernment listen carefully. In Isaiah chapter 28, the comparison of the crowns is what stood out to me. The Lord of heaven's armies will himself be Israel's glorious crown contrasted with the glorious crown of the drunks of Israel. Isaiah's explanation for at least some of the issues that Israel is in is alcohol, and it doesn't seem to be symbolic this time, I'm afraid. 
It seems to be a literal problem. Israel is led by drunks who reel with wine and stagger with alcohol. And he said it is the pride of people who are brought down by wine. And many people understand or have some experience for themselves of the spiral effects of an alcohol problem. That alcohol can feel like it has a voice of its own and it will defend itself. Who does the Lord think we are, they ask. Why does he speak to us like this? For them, it's aiding that pride that keeps them deceived. The coming destruction can never touch us, for we have built a strong refuge made of lies and deception. And this leads to a description of Jesus that we have already seen and we're going to see quoted again. And that will be that he will be a foundation stone in Israel, a firm and tested foundation stone. And it's a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes in him will never be shaken. So we will explore that metaphor in another blog because we are out of time for this week. And now we can celebrate our three quarters of the way through the journey. And I'm going to see you for the start of the very last quarter. The Chrome blog comes out each Thursday in 2022 and then lives in YouTube for eternity. If you want a reminder of new blogs each week, pop your email address on the website link below. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it will be easier to find it in your subscription tab. See you soon.